Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on 12 ways to ensure you are secure. All lines are on mute, and if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box on the right side of your screen. With that being said, I'd like to introduce James, who will be presenting today. Good afternoon or good morning to those joining us from the West. I'm James Leutri, VP of Professional Services for Lineco Computer Networks, Inc., and act in the capacity of virtual CIO for our clients. I bring over 25 years of experience across various verticals and can remember back to the good old days of my first major virus, the I Love You virus back in the 90s. I'm an advocate for clients, not a salesman. Our agenda for today is 12 ways to ensure you are secure, followed by Q&A. So like many Canadians, you probably want to take steps to help protect what's yours, like your devices, identity, online privacy, business, family, and home. That's why it's smart to help protect your internet connected devices and guard your sensitive business and personal information. Criminals and other malicious cyber threat actors many which operate outside of our borders, take advantage of security gaps, low cyber security awareness and technological developments to compromise cyber systems. They steal personal and financial information, intellectual property and trade secrets. They disrupt and sometimes destroy the infrastructure that we rely on for essential services and our way of life. I will be taking you through various ways to ensure that you are secure and mitigate, mitigating risk in 12 steps you can take to help protect yourself against cyber threats in 2020 and beyond. So we're going to start off with everyone's favorite, enabling multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication or identification, also called two-factor authentication, can help prevent cyber criminals from accessing your accounts. So it's wise to take the extra security step to enable multi-factor authentication on any accounts that require login credentials. Often a security code will be sent to your smartphone to complete the login process. Two-factor authentication is a security practice that adds another means of identification in which it can make a business system much more secure. The first factor is something that a person knows, like a password. And the second factor is something additional to be used in confirming the person's identity. The second factor can be something the user always has, like their fingerprint, which is now used widely at manor, many major border crossings, or sometimes they temporarily have such as a one-time password. Unlike a regular password, a one-time password cannot be guessed. And as the name suggests, it cannot be reused either. A one-time password is generated by the user with either a secure app, such as you know something from your smartphone, like the Google Authenticator app or the Microsoft Authenticator app, or a dedicated hardware device, which is often called a token. Either is portable and can be used as needed. In combination with a regular username and password, a one-time password greatly enhances authentication security. It is strongly recommended that you implement two-factor authentication in your business especially with respect to the protection of critical systems and information. You should start implementing two-factor authentication with simple services such as webmail. You may already have this set up with your banking, Facebook, Gmail, and Amazon. So along with two-factor authentication for enhanced security, consider using a passphrase instead of a password. A passphrase is more secure than a regular password as it is longer, more complex, and unpredictable, making it very hard to guess, even with the software tools that cyber criminals use. Be creative. So that sample there, you know, that, uh, that changes those E's to threes. So Spruce Decade Night Manager. So I don't think too many people can uh, guess that. So use the first letter of each word of a memorable sentence or phrase Then make it even tougher by changing some of the letters, as I've mentioned. So using a three to replace an E. Passwords are easy to guess, especially when they are any of the words that continue to be the favored security solution for a majority of users. So password, one, two, three, four, five, six, QWERTY, etc. Make your password strong and unique. 
a strong password containing at least 12 characters, including letters, numbers, and special symbols. Avoid using the same password on more than one account. With multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication, you can change your password less often. Never use your work email and password for personal accounts. Set up a separate email address just for your social networks and use unique passwords. Use different passwords for different online accounts, especially those dealing with sensitive or financial information. Remember, toothbrushes are like passwords. They are private, you don't share them, and you change them often. So managing user privileges is classifying and labeling sensitive information that is critical in its secure handling in your business. Many classification systems can be employed to help determine how sensitive information is and then to label it, example, as documents, files, records, etc. The key to this is to have a system in place that all your employees understand and follow. Your business will need to develop a method for classifying information and guidelines for labeling and handling that information. Only allow employees access to areas of the business that they have a legitimate need to be in. For example, salespeople usually don't need access and you know, ability to modify payroll. A simple classification model is easier to remember and follow. So one would be public. So public information is available to everyone and anyone, inside or outside your business, and requires no protection or special marking or handling. News posted to your business's website is an example of public information. Restricted information needs to be protected in some manner and is usually limited to a select group of people, including employees and certain clients, service providers, or others. This information will be controlled through various security safeguards you have put in place and should be labeled restricted. An example of restricted information is payroll information. Confidential information is limited to access by select individuals in your business. Its loss or exposure could damage your business. Confidential information must be labeled carefully and handled and should not be allowed to leave business premises or systems. An example of confidential information is intellectual property owned by the business or sensitive client data. So to help with all of this, we also encourage that you enable advanced threat protection. So if you're using Microsoft Office 365 for email, SharePoint, OneDrive, or MS Teams, you should be using Office 365 advanced threat protection as it safeguards your organization against malicious threats posed by email messages, links, and collaboration tools. There are other tools out there that have similar functionality to protect your Office 365, on-premise exchange server, Gmail, POP, or even IMAP. Don't give out personal information. Social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter are a great, great way to stay in touch with family, reconnect with friends, share news and photos, and broadcast what's on your mind. They're also a great way for cyber criminals to find out information about you. After all, most people provide a lot of personal details like where they work, who they're related to, when they're on holiday, their address, and so on, without giving it much thought, making it much easier for just about anyone to learn what they want to know about you. Remember, the more personal information you provide, the easier it is for a hacker to access it and potentially steal your identity, or for other criminals like stalkers or sexual predators to learn more about you. It's always a good idea to be discreet. If someone you don't know tries to friend you, ignore it. There's no way to be sure they are who you, they say they are. The most likely place a cyber criminal can get your financial information is from you. That's right. You may hand it right to an identity thief without even knowing it. Have backups, and I can't say this you know, enough. Back up your files. A backup plan is essential for your business. Without one, your business will risk losing critical information, such as client records and services, such as payment processing. Such losses can hurt your operations, damage your reputation, result in legal action, or even cause the failure of your business. 
Backups are used to restore lost or damaged files. Backing up your data will help ensure that your business is able to recover quickly and completely when a system crash, data corruption, or other setbacks occur. Ransomware is also a very likely form of attack and no amount of ransom will guarantee that you will get your data back. Wiping attacks are also possible where malware simply deletes everything on your hard drive. Back up all your data all the time. Consider using the 321 rule. Store anything important on two different online storage protocols, hard drive and cloud, for instance, or two different cloud services, and a third copy encrypted on a password protected external drive that is not connected. Become a skeptic. Be careful of scam and phishing emails. Phishing may seem like an ordinary part of ordinary life, but it could also be an initial volley in a major cyber attack. Phishing here is shorthand for the plethora of ishings, generic spear phishing, which is personalized, vishing, which is phone-based, and smishing, which is text-based. Uncertainty and misinformation have been more prevalent than usual during the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately for Canadians, these are exactly the conditions in which cyber scammers thrive. So a recent study of 150,000 phishing emails by Verizon partners found that 23% of recipients open phishing messages. The message could appear from a government agency, your bank, your place of worship, your gym, a colleague at work. It may look like the real thing. The only difference may be that it comes at the wrong time of the month, or you're pretty sure the stated problem is inaccurate. Phishing is a specific kind of spam that targets you by simulating a legitimate message to get you to give up that confidential information that can be used for criminal purposes. Pause before you click on a link in an email or open an attachment. Ask yourself these questions. Am I expecting to hear from this person or organization? Is it possible this is fake? If you have doubts, check it out. Go directly to your account or to the source, which you should always independently verify. If the communication refers to anything like a service or finance related, best way to avoid getting got is to self-navigate online, avoiding links sent via any media. Be wary of suspicious links. Don't click on them. And as previously mentioned, use advanced threat protection as part of your email protection as it checks links, attachments, and it helps identify phishing and spam emails. Segregation of duties, also known as separation of duties, is a concept of having more than one person required to complete a task. It is a key concept of internal controls and is the most difficult and sometimes the costliest one to achieve. The idea is to spread the task and privileges for security tasks among multiple people. No one person should do everything. Separation of duties is already a well-known in financial accounting systems. Companies of all sizes understand not to combine roles such as receiving checks and approving write-offs, depositing cash and reconciling bank statements, approving time cards, and have custody of paychecks, and so on. Separation of duties as it relates to security has two primary objectives. The first is the prevention of conflict of interest, real or apparent, wrongful acts, fraud, abuse, and errors. The second is the detection of control failures that include security breaches, information theft, and circumvention of security controls. Correct separation of duties is designed to ensure that individuals don't have conflicting responsibilities or are not responsible for reporting on themselves or their superior. An example would be to establish a policy at your business about transferring funds. In the era of deep fakes, it's important to know who is likely to request access to money and how it should be handled. Always double check by getting confirmation on the phone. You know, expect an attack. From the news, it can seem that only large businesses and major institutions are at risk. The reality, small and medium-sized businesses also tend to be very transactional and are highly vulnerable to disruptions in business activities. They also have fewer resources to draw on to prepare for and recover from a cyber security incident. Cyber criminals are developing more sophisticated attacks. 
while individuals and enterprises need to be more proactive in security practices. Ensure that you have a plan in place as well as policies to mitigate these risks. You also need to have a plan on what to do after an attack or breach. Did you know that if you have a breach, that there is a mandatory disclosure of data breaches and information leaks as part of the recently uh, brought out Canadian Data Privacy Act? And there's also fines for non-disclosure. 2018, 2019, and now 2020 have been landmark years for security vulnerabilities and have emboldened cyber criminals, including nation state actors, commandeering controls of computers, not just to extract a ransom from unwitting victims, but to utilize the computing power of devices to mine cryptocurrency, occasionally in ways which are physically destructive to the infected device. With COVID-19 and more remote workers, there has been an increase in attacks. Mass working over remote connection equals mass remote login activity, mostly over private and secure machines with user accounts that have never done so before, making remote login credentials an easy target for attackers. So that is why it's important to enable multi-factor authentication as part of any remote work that you're thinking of doing or are doing. With the number of ransomware attacks having taken place over the past year being higher than the last year, it's unlikely that this will slow down in 2020. It hasn't. Do your updates. Update everything. When your phone or computer alerts you to an available software or firmware update, pay attention and do what you're asked to do immediately, as opposed to clicking remind me later, because you'll just keep on clicking remind me later. So many of those patches are security related. Don't ignore them. Remember, IoT, Internet of Things devices also require updating to be secure as possible. So check to see if all your tech, including that smart doorbell, is up to date. Keeping your security software, web browser, and operating system updated to the latest version with updates that patch security holes that cyber criminals could exploit to access your personal information or infect your devices with malicious software. Remember, apply updates to your mobile devices, computers, and applications. Enable drive encryption. So encrypt your devices. Consider encrypting those files, devices, and drives. Encryption scrambles readable text, so only someone who has the decryption key can access and read it. So if, it's your, de if your device is lost or stolen, it's unusable. Hard drive encryption is a technology that encrypts the data stored on a hard drive using sophisticated mathematical functions. This can help prevent access to data by unauthorized persons and provides a layer of security against hackers and other online threats. Windows 10 has built-in encryption that can be turned on. BitLocker drive encryption is a Microsoft data protection feature that integrates with your Windows 10 operating system and addresses the threats of data theft or exposure from lost, stolen, or inappropriately de decommissioned computers. Simply put, you should, should your desktop or laptop fall in the wrong hands for whatever reason, you will have some peace of mind when, you're when you've enabled the security feature. Proper adoption of multi-factor authentication, as previously discussed, is very important for security. BitLocker accounts for this too by offering the option to lock the normal startup process until the user supplies a pin or inserts a removable device with a startup key. The security measure provides you with the assurance that company computers will not start or resume from hibernation until presented with a pin or startup key. If you use an iPad, iPhone, or Android device, you can also enable encryption and a startup pin. And finally, one of the most important things is to have security awareness training. Put resources into training your staff to recognize phishing scams and to practice good cyber hygiene. Training and sound cybersecurity policies can fill in the gaps where technology often fails. When it comes to being cyber resilient, it's not just about the technology, it's the people. Trying to keep up with cybersecurity can seem overwhelming. A good first step is putting in place a security awareness program. A security awareness program can be very simple and readily developed by you 
or with the assistance and support of your managed service provider. It should start with basic training for staff. Over time, it should expand to include updates and reminders on policies, standards, and best practices. Your security awareness plan can include a regular scheduled review to update existing security measures for your business, including adopting new means of protection, both software and hardware, as needed. Training and educating personnel is vital to having a strong cybersecurity system in place. Choose topics that are simple, focused, and concise. Key messages should be repeated, but it is important to engage with personnel in multiple ways to avoid having your messages ignored. For example, spam advice could be reinforced through emails, posters, and staff meetings. You could even supplement this with periodic quizzes, contests, and rewards to keep employees interested and involved. Thank you. So I do have a few questions here that have come in. Okay. Um, so the first question that I have is, is there legislation that governs specific industries or all industries as it relates to security or privacy? Uh, yes, in Canada, most provinces have uh, specific legislation. Um, so some are dedicated to healthcare. Uh, there's legislation in regards to food handling legislation, which uh, also revolves around information security. Um, there's the Canadian Standards Association, which has various standards. In Canada, we have PIPDA, which is the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. Um, in British Columbia and in Alberta, they have the Personal Information Protection Act. And I had mentioned in the presentation that uh, from PIPEDA came uh, the Digital Privacy Act, which is the mandatory disclosure of data breaches and information leaks. And in regards to all of this, uh, there's FIPA, which is the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, as well as the Privacy Act of Canada, Protecting Canadians from Online Crime, Criminal Code of Canada, and if you are you know, processing credit card payments, there's the uh, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, or PCI DSS. But th there's a lot of legislation out there. The next question I have here is, what is information security management? So because a lot of uh, organizations nowadays, you know, create, aggregate and store massive amounts of information from their customers, uh, including different analytics, usage data, personal information, credit cards, et cetera, um, information security management basically describes a set of policies and procedures, uh, procedural controls that IT and business organizations uh, would implement to secure their information assets against threats and vulnerabilities. Uh, a lot of organizations are getting these questions, especially if they're dealing with organizations in the US or other jurisdictions that require, you know, like what are your policies? How often are you updating your policies? Um, so that is something that, that I do as a virtual CIO where I will provide uh, policy templates. Um, if an organization doesn't have a chief security officer or a CTO or somebody else to do that. And the last question I have here is, is there a governing body or agency in Canada for cybersecurity and what businesses should be doing? Uh, yes, so there's Cyber Secure Canada. Uh, you can go to www.canada.ca forward slash cyber secure. There's a lot of excellent resources for organizations of all sizes there. And um, your organization, regardless of the size, uh, can become certified, uh, you know, or you can get a third party to help you become certified. Um, if you're also looking for uh, e-learning tools, they have a number of free uh, e-learning tools and resources there. And the other site that I would recommend is uh, getcybersafe.gc.ca. And you know, this is where um, you would also report a cyber in incident as legislated by the uh, Digital Privacy Act. 
and they have a lot of great posters. So if you're looking at implementing a security awareness uh, program within your organization, they have great posters and other resources, and they have a lot of resources now on uh, COVID-19 scams. So lots of great information. So with that being all of the questions for now, I would just like to take a time to thank everyone for coming to our webinar during their busy days, as well as you, James, for presenting today. Thank you. A form will appear when the webinar concludes where you can enter any more questions you may have. Additionally, this form will be available in the email sent out with the webinar recording. And the answers to these questions will be shared through email as well as a blog recap of the webinar. So thank you everyone again for attending. And I hope that you found it beneficial.